Hello once again, everyone, and welcome to the Generations Bible Study of St. Stephen Church in Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Ken Jobst, and we are continuing today in a study of the New Testament book of Hebrews. We'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 9 today, and I've got to tell you what, let me just share my heart with you. Ready? You've made it so far into Hebrews already. And I'll, I'm just going to be completely honest with you. You know, so many people, when they sit down to study Hebrews, they're, they're captured by the, the theme of the book, which is the superiority of Jesus Christ in so many different ways. Uh, Christ as superior to the angels, Christ as superior to the, the prophets, so on and so forth. And then the writer of Hebrews gets on this... Uh, gets on the topic of Christ as the superior high priest. And we follow that logic for a good while, for, for like three or four chapters. And we come to chapter nine. And, you know, if, you, if you're the kind of person that reads a chapter a day and you, you come to chapter nine and you say, Oi, we're still talking about the high priest. Oh, my goodness. Why? How is it that we could still... You know, are we beating a dead horse here? Should, do, we, do we understand it? Do we get it? And I want to say that your, your, uh, your intellectual fortitude will certainly be rewarded. Because as we're studying Christ as the superior high priest, we're coming to a greater and greater appreciation of what that means in our own lives today. So don't, don't be weary in well-doing, right? right? We're, we're going to press forward. And today we're going to be looking at the entirety of chapter 9, chapter 9, verses 1 through 28. And I just want to pick it up and we're going to, uh, we may, you know, there, there's a theme in chapter 9. And I want to develop this theme. And the theme focuses on one word that's repeated in chapter 9. But it's a key word. And it's, it's a word for which all of this discussion of high priestly ministry of Jesus is going to crystallize for us. Because we, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for the big aha, now I get it. Right? So, Let's, let's dive in to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. Let's take verse 1 through 5. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. Okay, I'm stopping right there. We're at the end of verse 5. I love the writer of Hebrews. Someday in heaven, I just want to shake his hand. Um, because as an instructor, as a teacher, you know, he's, he's giving us context, but he's going to say, I'm, uh, I'm going to show you this whole big context, but we're not going to go into that right now. So in these opening five verses, he's saying, look, I, I want to set up our discussion for you. You know how the temple is set up. The temple is set up in these two primary areas. You've got the sanctuary and the Holy of Holies. In the sanctuary, you've got the showbread and the, the table and the lampstand. That's, that's you know, where, where the priests do their priestly ministry. And then there's the Holy of Holies in which is the Ark of the Covenant and Aaron's rod that budded and the pot of manna 
right? So he does an excellent job of describing all of these things that are in the temple. And then he says, after having described them, he says, we're not going to talk about those right now. Now, um, many preachers can preach long and, and long and strong on any of these elements of the tabernacle, on the tabernacle itself, on the sanctuary, on the Holy of Holies, and on the furnishings. Seriously, I, I could preach 10 sermons on the, the furnishings of the tabernacle. Uh, would not be a problem at all. But then we would be diverted from the point that the author of Hebrews is trying to make, and it's an important point. So the author of Hebrews is telling us, press on. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to press on. Now, verse 6. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Now, uh, uh, there's a little. I want to give a little bit of a uh, translation. I want to give a little bit different idea on that translation. That could also read, while the first tabernacle still had standing. Because remember, the tabernacle, the tabernacle, technically speaking, was a tent. And the tabernacle was su superseded by the temple, which was made of stone. Now, at the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews, the stone temple was still standing, meaning that all of those statutes and ordinances, the entire sacrificial system, all of that was still in standing as well. So we're not just talking about the tabernacle standing. That, that tent tabernacle had been long gone. But the, the whole idea of the sacrificial system still had standing. Right? Okay, that's, that's the difference. I just wanted to impress that upon our hearts. Um, by the way, one, one other thing while I'm pausing here. Um, remember, it was only on the Day of Atonement that the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies, and he, not without blood. He would always bring a blood sacrifice. And he would go into the Holy of Holies. And i got to let you know, this, this was an intensely uh, powerful moment during the year. The high priest would be wearing his priestly robes, would go into the Holy of Holies, and remember that the priest's robe, at the, the hem of his robe, he had a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, alternating all the way around the hem of his robe. As he moved in the Holy of Holies, remember nobody else can go in there, the sound of the, the bells would indicate that the high priest was still indeed alive. Uh, this was not the kind of thing where somebody saunters in to their buddy uh, who is our father in heaven, uh, you know, the big guy upstairs kind of treatment. No, no, no. This is something that produces tremendous awe and fear. Uh, so this was not done lightly. As, as a matter of fact, extra biblical sources, that, that is some Jewish sources, uh, not canonical biblical scripture, but some other historical Jewish sources would say that the high priest would have a rope tied around his ankle, that as he went into the Holy of Holies, if he were struck dead in the Holy of Holies, they'd be able to pull him out without violating the Holy of Holies. And since they were not high priests, they would have to come fetch the body out. Remember Nadab and Abihu who offered profane fire, is struck dead by God. Um, the, the priest didn't want to, you know, have a repeat of that kind of situation. So this was always something of profound significance and import. 
Now, let me go back to verse 7. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Now, that, there's that word, conscience. The first occurrence of the word conscience in this chapter. We're going to be talking about conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, there it is the second time, that term conscience. So two times, the, 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 the central focus we're going to see of this chapter is how all of this impacts our conscience. Now, verse 15, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who were called may receive the promise of the in eternal inheritance. Verse 16, now watch this, watch the logic in verse 16. For where there is a testament, there must also by necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament, by the way, the, the word that we would use today is a will. For a testament is enforced after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Now, that's the entirety of Hebrews chapter 9. And we've 
we've heard some familiar, uh, familiar verses there, have we not? As it is appointed unto men to die once, and then after that the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Right? We, we get one life, we're appointed to die once, and after that the judgment. And then also in, in verse 22, we've heard that familiar phrase that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Now, very, very quickly, uh, I, I want to just encapsulate these. There's five sections, basically five paragraphs in this ninth chapter of Hebrews. And in the first paragraph, we get the furnishings and the layout of the temple. Okay? And, and it's like, we're not going to talk about that, but you got to know about that so these things make sense moving forward. The second paragraph is about the service and the priests in the tabernacle. The third paragraph is the, about the contrasting superior high priestly ministry of Jesus. In the fourth paragraph, which is verses 16 through 22, we're reminded that a will is only activated after the death of the testator. Right? The, the, if I write a will... The, the will is inoperative until I die. So the writer of the will has to die for the testament or the will to be able to come into effect. And then verses 23 through 28, we find Christ's one-time sacrifice for many. So we're talking about then, as the, the entirety of the chapter, we're talking about the high priestly ministry of Jesus and in particular, we're going to see today how it impacts the conscience. Now, I, I love this. This is, um, this, is, this is going to touch on so many different aspects of um, Christian theology right here. But the conscience is a part of our original equipment. And it's... Uh, written into our, written into our self. You know, uh, God is, God is a Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, you could look at time as a Trinity, past, present, future, right? We are a Trinity. Uh, we are a Trinity in that we are spirit, soul, and body. Our body is a Trinity in that it is. You know, but biblically, it is flesh, blood, and bone. Uh, our, our soul is a trinity, right? Our soul is made up of intellect, emotion, and will or desire, right? So intellect, emotion, desire, that's our soul. Now, as it turns out, our spirit is also in three parts. We have intuition, which is a spiritual way of knowing. We have communion, which is a spiritual fellowship. And we have conscience. Now, let me, let me just uh, talk a little bit about conscience, which is we, we've got to understand conscience for us to fully understand what's going on in Hebrews chapter 9. So our, our conscience is a part of our spiritual makeup. And contrary to what uh, a, a lot of people think, right, that the, the conscience does not tell us right from wrong. Our training, our upbringing, right, our training tells us what's right and what's wrong. Conscience is simply that organ which insists that at any juncture we do the right thing. So once again, it's not your conscience that is um, telling us right and wrong. You, you have to learn that. That's learned. But your conscience is always going to insist on the right instead of the wrong. So, um, but by the way, did you know your conscience can make a mistake? You can have a mistaken conscience. And, and this is where I, I kind of come into a, a little of a conflict 
with those who understand conflict, excuse me, they, they understand conscience from um, Walt Disney and Jiminy Cricket in Peter Pan, right? And in Peter Pan, what, what's the, the advice? The advice is let your conscience be your guide and that Jiminy Cricket is going to be uh, the, the one that tells you what's right and wrong. Now, now watch this. I don't want to get too deep in this, but um, Jiminy Cricket is the name of the cricket in Peter Pan, right? And by the way, back in the day, Back in the day when folk didn't use curse words in public, or if, if they did, they were, you know, ostracized, there was a substitute phrase that was used in place of, you know, making an actual oath or swearing. Uh, it was kind of a euphemism. And instead of invoking the name of the Savior which would have been blasphemous and would have been something that would have ostracized the person saying it in certain contexts. There was a, a substitute phrase, which was Jiminy Cricket. So if, if, for example, you hit your thumb with a hammer, right, and there was somebody around, you might say Jiminy Cricket. If, if the kids drew on the walls with crayons, you would come in... Jiminy Cricket, right? Oh, okay, now, watch, watch, because we're on to something here. What's Jiminy Cricket's initials? JC? D does that tell us anything? Right? Okay, it, it, it tells us this, that our conscience does not make up right and wrong, but that we have to turn to an outside authority. We have to turn to a moral authority whose initials are also J.C., Jesus Christ, to give us, to, to, to be able to calibrate our conscience. So your conscience is like a thermostat. It is set to the highest level of morality that you have experienced or have accepted, right? Right? So your conscience itself was, let me say it this way, your conscience was never designed to run on its own, to be its own thing. It's only to be the thermostat to kick on the furnace of Jesus Christ, right? I, I, I need to look to Jesus for right and wrong, and I need to do the right. Now, now watch, because this is important also. The conscience works both before and after the fact, right? A, a, a lot of us think of the conscience as only working after we make a decision or after we do something bad or, or whatever, that our, our conscience will hound us. But actually, before we make a decision, be before we commit to a course of action one way or another, the conscience can prod us in the right direction. The conscience can goad us into doing the right thing. And remember, a goad was a, a stick with a little metal pointy end on it that you would use to, to herd oxen or, or cattle. Uh, because, you know, cattle are big and they're slow moving and, you know, they may or may not go the way you want them to. They need a little prodding. And that's what the conscience does for the rest of the person. Before the decision, the conscience prods us into the right direction. I, you know, um, if you're loading cattle into a chute, for example, and you, need, you want the cattle to go down this chute instead of the other chute, you prod them in that direction, right? So the conscience works before the decision, before the action, but conscience also works after the action. And conscience works in this way. Conscience works to prod beforehand, but conscience works to punish if we make the wrong decision afterwards. And let me go on to say that conscience also afterwards we can rely on our conscience to give us a little bit of praise. Like, whew, glad I didn't incur the, the, the penalty that the folk who went the wrong way incurred. So, so we can, 
we can have a little praise break there when our conscience, when we discover that our conscience led us correctly. Now, let's come back to the scripture. Let's come back to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9, which says, in, in chapter 9, verse 9, it was symbolic of the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience. Now, uh, being made perfect with respect to conscience means that your conscience has matured and that your conscience has matured you. So, um, what's being referred to right here is one's conscience being plagued over guilt, over good things that have not been done. So here we're talking about sins of omission rather than sins of commission. In the context of chapter 9, verse 9, the issue is this. I sin, I need to bring a sin offering, a fellowship offering, a peace offering. I need to bring those to the temple. And when I bring those to the temple, I offer them to the priest. The priest then uh, makes the offering on my behalf. And then I get the assurance that for, for that sin, for that event, I have made things right with God. I, you know, things might not still be right with my neighbor or whoever I've offended, but at least I've, I've recognized my fault. I've tried to do something about it by bringing this sacrifice to God. Okay? So from God's perspective, uh, after the sacrifice is complete, then that event of sin... I, I don't have to have my conscience bug me about it anymore because it's, okay, that one's dealt with. But how many of you know we don't just sin once or twice, right? We, we've got, oh my goodness. And as soon as I'm being conscientious about dealing with one particular sin, then I'm going to discover, wait a minute, I've got five or six or nine or 14 others that need to be dealt with as well. And so in, in verse 9, it says that whoever, you know, you perform the service, you go do the thing, you'll never be perfect with regard to your conscience. Your, your conscience will never let you go because you've discovered this sin, but what about this one? And it, it, you reacted to that one, but what about the next one? And so on and so forth. So, wow, uh, it is as if that earlier system will never, ever give us rest if we have a plagued conscience over sin, right? Now, look at verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Cleanse your conscience. So I've got a conscience that is, is in verse 9, it's an imperfect conscience. It's a conscience that is restless. It's a conscience that is not complete and whole and at rest yet because I've got these other sins to take care of. And then in verse 14, uh, I, need a, I have a conscience that needs to be cleansed. Now, and, and watch, cleansed from dead works to serve the living God. I need to have my conscience cleansed from dead works. Now, to explain this second use of the term conscience, we're talking about the same, you know, in hardwired, inbuilt spiritual faculty that we all have. I want to give an illustration that you're probably familiar with. This is an illustration from Psalm number 51. Remember, Psalm 51 was the psalm that David wrote after he had been confronted by Nathan with respect to his sin in the adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah the Hittite. Here's what David says. By the way, this psalm is, is a beautiful, beautiful picture of a contrite heart, right? Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17 says, For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight 
in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So this is David. This is David recognizing that God isn't just looking for the blood of a goat or a lamb, you know, that, that God is not focused on the sacrifice. God is looking for a change in the heart, a change in the spirit of the person, not just going through a formal external ritual, but actually a person whose heart is changed. Now watch, watch. This, this is crucial because this is getting at the heart of the argument that's being made by the author of Hebrews in chapter 9. The author of Hebrews is pointing out the profound limitations that were a part of the previous covenant's sacrificial system. And there are three of them, right? The first, the first profound limitation is this. That, that sacrificial system, you can... You can go through that system, you can perform that system, and only be looking at the outer person with no change in the inner person. Now, right, I, I, can, I can go through the ritual at the temple or the tabernacle. I can go through the ritual, I can bring the goat or the dove or the, the, the bull, I can bring them to the priest, I can have the priest slaughter them, burn the, the sacrifice, stand there while the aroma rises to God. I can do that every day and still have no change in my inner person. I can still be the same irascible, uh, you know, no good conniving person, but I've gone through the external ritual every step of the way. Now, you know what that's like? That's like somebody... It, it, Focus on the external instead of on the internal. That's like somebody that goes out and buys a new suit whenever they smell themselves, right? Whenever, whenever they get dirty, they go and buy a new suit instead of taking a bath. What you need is a bath. You don't need a new suit every day. You need a bath. So... You, you need to deal with the interior, not just dealing with the exterior. Now, here's the second limitation. Here's the second limitation. Each of the ordinances, each of the sacrifices, right, all of the feast days, all of the stuff that was attendant, the, the priesthood, all, everything that was attendant to the prior covenant, all of it was intended to convey a deeper message. Like, Okay, the ritual itself was never the point. The entire sacrificial system was essentially a parable. It was something, remember, remember when Jesus gave the parables? And he, he would say, well, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a man that went out to sow seed. And the, the disciples afterwards came to him and said, well, what did you mean by that? We, we want to understand that more fully. We want to know, what do you mean? Whereas other people who may have heard Jesus say, the kingdom of heaven is like a sower that went out to sow seed, they let it go. That They were like, oh, well, whatever. It turns out the entire sacrificial system, the priesthood, the sacrifices, the offerings, the, 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 the feast days, all of that, the calendar, all of that was something meant to be a parable, meant for us to see the deeper message. That's, that's the, the, the brilliance and the profound insight that John the Baptist had when he saw his cousin Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's making a bridge between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. He's saying, you know what? If you had 10,000 times 10,000 lambs, you still got the sin problem. Oh, but the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, will take away the sin of the world. 
Okay, so, so that's the, the second limitation. The third limitation of the, the former system was that, you know, the, the, the former ritual system, you never needed to touch the conscience. It had no interplay with the conscience. So for those three reasons, you've got a, a sacrificial system. It was meant to point to something, and it pointed to Jesus. Now watch. I'm going to boil this down for us. The first covenant depended upon the activity of the worshiper. So it's the worshiper who brings the sacrifice. It's the worshiper who, who says, oh, what, okay, I, I got to get right with God. I'm going to bring this sacrifice. And, and under, the first, under the first covenant, it only impacted the body. I, I need to physically get up, put a halter on that bull, and lead rope on the sheep. I need to take them to Jerusalem. And it, it, it's, it's largely you know, like muscle memory. You know, this is something I need to do. So it's something I do physically. But it's never a thing about the conscience. The latter covenant does not depend on the activity of the worshiper, but rather depends on the work of Christ. And so our conscience then is confronted with Christ's sacrifice, with the, the, the sacrifice of Christ's blood. Now watch, I said that our conscience is like a thermostat, and it's set to the highest moral order that we can possibly be exposed to. And that highest moral order is a perfect, without spot or blemish, sinless, perfect sacrifice, which is the life of Jesus Christ. And one other way we say that is the blood of Jesus Christ. By the way, I want, to, I want this to be very clear. It, it's not that Jesus could have gone to Calvary and simply donated a pint of blood and that that would have been fine. No, no, no. We're talking about the death of Jesus as the sacrifice. Now, uh, you know, I know, all of our activity adds nothing to our acceptance by Christ. There, there's nothing we can do to make Christ accept us. It's all by grace. We're accepted by Christ by grace. And it's, you know, our salvation is that salvation by the perfect sacrifice, by the blood of the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. You know what? Very last book of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it says, we're talking about the overcomers, right? It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Right? They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, which is to say a change on the inside, an interior change. Well, I want to thank you once again for, uh, for hanging in there with us with this exposition of what's going on in the uh, New Testament book of Hebrews as we're continuing, and we will continue next time with chapter 10 as we look at the, the continuing superiority of Christ as our high priest. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, I want to give you thanks for that high priestly ministry. Thank you for uh, investing in each of us a conscience, Lord, that is attuned to your spirit. Help us, Heavenly Father, in these days ahead to, to recognize that it's by your blood that we're, we are saved from sin. We thank you, Lord, for the anointing that you have placed upon us. And now, Lord, we just want to give you a prayer of thanks for the fellowship that we enjoy as part of the Generations Bible Study. Pray your continued blessing upon our pastor. And pray, Lord, that you would just continue to be with us. Help us to grow in our knowledge of you, in our love for you, and our service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, from Louisville, Kentucky and St. Stephen Church, this is Ken Jokes with the Generations Bible Study. I hope to see you again next time. God bless. Bye-bye.